Good morning, everybody. My name is Darren St. George, and we today we are having a chit chat with Sal to talk about Yankee Doodle Dandy. Of course, Fourth of July is happening very soon, so this is our tribute to the Fourth. And uh, I think we have a great show. We really do. This is exciting. We're thankful that you're all here and making us part of your Monday morning routine. It means a lot to all of us. Without further ado, the man of the hour, Sal, hop on board. How are you doing this morning? Let's get started. <laughs> oh, and we already have a chat. Oh, all right. I think, yeah, I think you have to turn back my uh, camera, Darren. Oh, I have to allow you? Yes. Okay, you got it. Hang on one second, and I'll get you going. Here we go. There you are. Okay. You are now allowed <laughs> to have a camera again. Before we started, I had to mute All it. right, there we go. There Good we morning, go. everybody. Welcome Good morning. Well, yeah, as Darren said, this is going to be a very, very fun program today. And what's kind of interesting, Darren's too young to remember this, but many of you out there are going to remember a uh, program that used to air on Channel 9, WORTV, called The Million Dollar Movie. They would run the same movie every single day, and it would be continuous. I mean, you could watch it every night uh, on the weekends. Uh, that's how many of us were introduced to King Kong and, and a lot of the other films. But Yankee Doodle was one on one of the movies that I remember seeing over and over and over again as a kid. Now, several years ago, I got the notion. I remembered the movie so well. It's always been one of my favorites, and I didn't know if anybody else even remembered it. So I put the program together and the next thing I know, I'm getting calls from libraries and colleges and universities. Can you come in and do this for the 4th of July? And it became very popular. And what, what was most gratifying to me is not only that you remembered the movie, but the movie still held up. It's really a strong, powerful film. Um, we wanted to talk about the, um, the new thing, right, Darren? Absolutely. Yeah, let's get so started. Let me, let me, and we're just going to play around with this a little bit. But starting with our next lectures, we're going to have something called Did You Know? Now, Did You Know is really important because what it's going to do is I remember, and I talked to Darren about this, when I was in high school, I remember I always just wanted to know a little bit about everything. And it didn't matter if I knew everything about architecture or everything about um, the pyramids. I just wanted to know enough so that if I sat down with somebody, I would sound knowledgeable about that subject. And what I want to do, did you know, is going to make you the envy of all your friends and relatives. If somebody says to you, by the way, I just saw Yankee Doodle. Oh, did you know that in Yankee Doodle Dandy? And you, you'll have 12 facts that you can rattle off one after another and sound like you really know everything about how that movie was made. Or you could talk about Lucy from the past uh, uh, programs we did, or Danny Kaye or Red Skelton. We have enough that we're giving you with that don't just look at this as a means of in killing an hour on Monday morning. This is a great way for you to expand your knowledge and use it to impress your friends and your neighbors and your family. They're going to think you're a know-it-all, but so, so what? You are. <laughs> you do know it all. So um, anyway, Did You Know is going to start with our next uh, session, and we're going to give you all the facts so that you can go out and be an expert on just about any subject matter. Did I say it right? Yeah, fantastic. That's what we're looking for. And can I show them the new homepage where they can register? Um, yeah, but first, did you want to show them? Did you know? Did you know? Oh, well, it's the first here. Here we go. We can show. Did you know? Of course, we have. Did you know? <laughs> there it is. OK, yeah. so every every session will begin with this and it's going to say, did you know Jackie Gleason? Did you know Billy Crystal? Did you know uh, MASH? Each one of those will change according to the subject that we're um, pursuing that particular day. Yep. And speaking of those subjects, here's our next lineup. Based on popular demand, we now have coming next Monday, we're doing Did You Know Jackie Gleason? followed by a virtual road trip to the John Wayne Museum. Then we have Did You Know Billy Crystal? 
a local boy makes good. And then at the end of the month, we're finishing off July with Bilko to Mash. Did you know? Excellent. So we're, we're really looking forward to to these programs. So in the in the past, oh, this is actually huh, my version of the website. <laughs> you can see my uh, my edit builder and everything over here. Well, we'll in, check all that later on, Darren. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, let's get on with the show. You got it. I don't want to bore them. I want to keep it moving. Okay. So we're talking about, <clears throat> again, one of my favorite movies, and we can go to the first slide. Here it is. How can you not enjoy this movie? Um, and and I, I, I was just telling Darren a very interesting uh, fact. About a year and a half ago, I was doing this lecture, uh, the, uh, the uh, live lecture. These lectures are all different. Uh, what we're doing online has nothing to do with I, what I do in person. Uh, these are all uh, specifically crafted and built just for you. They're all brand new lectures. So um, I was doing the, the Janky Doodle uh, lecture and um, a woman raised her hand and at the end and she said, it's okay, but it's a little bit too patriotic. <laughs> it was the first time I ever saw my audience turn on somebody so, so uh, angrily. Um, I don't know, the flag waving, this was all part of what this movie was about. It was what George uh, M. Cohan was about. Uh, it's what Jimmy Cagney was about. And we're gonna go into all that right now. So let's go to the first slide, Darren. Because if you go down and how many times you've been on, on in Times Square and you saw this statue standing there, the George M. Cohan statue, you know what? Millions of people passed it. The only ones that are appreciating it at this point are the pigeons. Nobody remembers who George M. Cohan was. But as you can see, he was on Time Magazine. He was, as they dubbed him, the man who owned Broadway. He had um, uh, so many uh, uh, plays under his belt. He was just a constant... Uh, well, th before there was a Neil Simon writing all these plays, before there was a Sondheim, this is the guy that invented, this is the gentleman that invented what a Broadway show was about. He made the story, uh, the play about a story. It, before that, many of the shows that were on Broadway were reviews, follies, things like that. He came up with the idea of putting together a play where the music advances everything and it's part of the storyline. Um, what was interesting about him, he wrote over 300 songs in his lifetime. Many of them we know. And I think Darren has a, um, a little survey that he wants to give you right now. I but do. Let's see here. Hold on. Um, favorite. George and Cohan song. So we have four options here. We're interested. What is your favorite George M. Cohan song? And we have over there, Give My Regards to Broadway, The Yankee Doodle Boy, or your A Grand Old Flag. And right away, Give My Regards to Broadway. <laughs> we may have a bias here. Most of our viewers are from New York. And it is taking away this, <laughs> taking the lead far and beyond. Let's see here. Give My Regards to Broadway, The Yankee Doodle Boy, and Your Grand Old Flag are the three competing. Over there just got its first vote. <laughs> so that's not one of the most popular, but that's okay. Let's see here. And, oh, we also have, I hope the George M. Cohan statue is safe. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure, especially in, in Times Square. It belongs there, it does. Let's take a look. And then we, I think we have a, de a decisive vote, um, verdict. So over there, it comes in fourth place. Yankee Doodle Boy is in third place. Second place goes to your grand old flag. And the winner today, give my regards to Broadway. Absolutely fantastic music. All Just so you know, when uh, George M. wrote your grand old flag, he originally wrote it. It was your grand old rag. And uh, the reason he wrote rag is because he was talking to an old Civil War uh, veteran. And that's what he said to him. We were there to protect that old rag. That was how he said it. And he wrote it that way, but he got such kickback from it that he realized he's got to change it from rag to flag, uh, which was more appropriate. 
so here we are. He, in, in, starting in 1904, he had uh, like 30 shows going, uh, sometimes five a week going on. He not only wrote, directed, produced, he starred in it, did all the music, the book. Uh, so not, not yet, thank you. Um, when, uh, when he started, come to the 1940s, he realized just like we realize today, that statue, people walk by it, but they have no idea who George M. Cohan is. By the 1940s, he was feeling that same thing. He was uh, in his early 60s, and he was feeling that his time had come, that people were forgetting who he was, and was there a way that he could, in some way, uh, keep his name alive with the American people? And his idea was, let's get a movie made about me. So he approached uh, several producers and the one that nabbed it, that went after it was um, Sam Goldwyn. And Sam Goldwyn, as we learned with the Danny Kaye movies, was always producing all kinds of films, musicals in particular. He said, great, I'm going to produce your story, George, and I've got the perfect leading man to play your part. We're going to go to the next slide. And this is who he thought was going to play George M. Cohan. There we go. We got the next slide. There it is, Fred Astaire. Can you picture Fred Astaire playing this part? Not after you've seen Cagney, but more astutely, Fred Astaire knew Fred Astaire. And he said to Sam, and he said to him, he said, I appreciate the offer. I, I really respect the music of George M. Cohan. And I, I, the, the man is, is, is a uh, an icon and in, 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 in a legend on Broadway, but I don't think I can do him justice. My dance style is nothing at all like George M. Cohan's, and he politely uh, backed out of the pro project. Okay, so let's go backwards a little bit. We're going to go to the next slide. Several years earlier, we're talking about about 10 years earlier, maybe more, there was a young hoofer by the name of James Cagney, and he came to movies from appearing on Broadway and in shows. He was a, he was a song and dance man. That's what he did, and that's what he did best. Uh, and th that's what he loved, to be honest with you. And <clears throat> he, as a young dancer, had auditioned for George M. Cohan to be in one of his shows. And George M. Cohen rejected him. He was unknown at, the at that time. He was just a another dancer that came down to uh, be part of the program. But uh, George M. Cohen rejected him uh, during his audition. We're going to go to the next slide. Now, we know that Jimmy Cagney was a great dancer. But then he makes a movie and uh, it just changes his life. Once he made Public Enemy, he became the gangster. And that's how people saw him. They didn't, he was so convincing, especially Angels with Dirty Faces, which is one of my favorite Cagney movies, one of the great endings of any movie. If you remember it, he plays Rocky Sullivan. He's going to the, um, um, his, to his death, they're going to execute him. And uh, Pat O'Brien is walking him down on the last mile there. And uh, he's telling him that he's got to do something so that he doesn't end up being an idol to the dead end kids. He didn't want him to be a martyr in death. Great movie, great finale. And people to this day always argue, was he a coward when he went to uh, the gas chamber or did he, or to the electric chair, or was he doing it just for the kids? Interesting. So he, um, he, he's now in, in, in labeled a gangster and in many of the movies that he's portraying for the next dozen years or so, he's always playing a tough guy. He's got some good roles in between there where he's not, but in general, everybody knows Cagney as a tough guy. Now, he had a little problem going into the late 30s. A newspaper reporter out of the clear blue wrote an article about Jimmy Cagney and in it, he claimed that James Cagney was a communist. It was, um, it was, it, it was deadly to his career. It was deadly to him. We can go to the next slide. This was the time when people were yeah, worried about uh, communists in the movie industry. 
and uh, he didn't know how to handle this. He, uh, he was he he did not have this was, I guess, the beginning of, of false news. He had no way of fighting this off, even though they eventually uh, cleared him and they put in retractions. The retraction still tainted his life. And people still believe that he was a communist. He was a liberal. That, uh, he was a Democrat. He did not um, at all uh, subscribe to the Communist Party. But this was the label that they tagged on him. And he talked to his brother and he said, we got to find a way to get out of this. We have to find a way to prove that I am not a communist. And what they did was he worked for Warner Brothers and they went to the next slide, Darren. Uh, they went to talk to Jack Warner. That's Jack Warner on the left. He and Cagney had been working for years together. They had a very adversarial but friendly business relationship. Um, uh, Jack Warner always called Jimmy Cagney a professional against her. He said, whatever I bring up, he's against it. And that's the way that he was always doing that. Now, in the two pictures you see on the right, the gentleman with Jimmy is his brother, Bill, Billy, uh, William, William Cagney. Uh, William Cagney was also James Cagney's um, manager. He spoke for him. Whenever there was a problem, he would say to Jimmy, don't come to the set tomorrow and I'll take care of it. If they were making a movie, he would walk off the set, Jimmy. Billy would go in to see Jack Warner. They would renegotiate whatever the situation was, if something was going wrong with the movie or money or whatever. And inevitably, whenever they finished their conversation, Jimmy always ended up with a better contract, always got a better contract from Warner Brothers. So he goes to uh, Jack Warner <clears throat> and he tells him uh, what they want to do. They want to create the George M. Cohan story. You have to remember, when you talk about George M. Cohan back then, it's like talking about Sinatra. Everybody knew who George M. Cohan was. Although Cohan felt that he was uh, out, of, out of the loop at this point and people had forgotten him, everybody still remembered the, the, the strength of the name of George M. Cohan. And <clears throat> Jack said, yep, we're going to do it. And not only did he want to do it, he said, this is going to be our, what they called in those days, our prestige movie. We're putting everything we've got into this film to make it the best movie possible. If we can go to the next slide. I find this interesting. They did a uh, publicity shot of the four Cohans on top and there's the four Cohans on the bottom. And you can see how they uh, uh, look very much like their counterparts. It's a wonderful picture of all of them. The picture on the left I put there because <clears throat> one of the great taglines in movies came out of this one. And it was, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and I thank you. Um, that was not George M. Cohan's um, tagline. He took it, he bought it actually from an old vaudevillian by the name of Julius Tannen, who was retiring. He had been using it for many years. George M. thought it would be appropriate for himself and his family, and he was able to um, buy it from him to use as his own tagline. So I always found that kind of interesting. Another thing, um, what I want to show you, <clears throat> if, we, if we're talking about the family here, if we go to the next slide, Besides his brother being a, uh, um, his manager and his executive producer and all, his sister, that's his real sister in the movie. And Gene Craig, uh, Cagney, excuse me, uh, played the part uh, perfectly as his sister. She went on and did quite a few other movies after this. Um, and the reason I have that slide on the right, oh my gosh, this is really going to tap into memory banks back there. There was a TV show, Darren, that goes back to the 50s. It, uh, let me just, it was called, you're not going to believe this. It was called Queen for a Day. I, oh. If anybody remembers it, just 
send in a thing to say, I remember. <laughs> but Queen for a Day is probably one of the first reality shows on TV. And people would come out and they would tell their story of, of woe, their sob story. And at the end, the audience would vote to see who would get um, the gifts, which were everything from washing machines and everything to make their lives better. But anyway, Gene... Uh, was on that program for many years. I'm trying to get the dates here. From 56 to 1963, she was part of the uh, panel there. And you should, you Ooh, should know Queen the chat Queen. window is exploding. Everybody remembers this. Uh, oh, it's my good. favorite show. Jack Bailey, was he the host? I was just about to say, Jack. that's Jack Bailey right oh, there on the right. Yeah, they and beat you to it, Pop. They, <laughs> they have it here. Jack Bailey popped up a couple of times. Everybody remember this. My mom loved the show. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, queen for a day. <laughs> so anyway, we just I just wanted to show that even though the Cohans had a family that was on the stage together, uh, Jimmy was bringing his family with, with, with his brother and sister in with him on this project. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next slide because I wanna go over some of the people in this movie. Uh, top left, uh, that's uh, Rosemary DeCamp, and that's, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Walter Houston, that's uh, playing his mother and father. That's them backstage. In the, uh, by the way, Rosemary DeCamp and uh, Walter Houston was nominated for Best Supporting Actor in this movie. Uh, Rosemary, I, I wanted to mention a quick thing. This, I, again, here's a little piece of trivia for you. If you saw the movie The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio, where they told the story about Howard Hughes, there is a great scene in the movie where he loses control of one of his test planes and he crashes into Beverly Hills. One of the houses that he crashed into was Rosemary's house. She was asleep in bed with her husband. They, uh, they survived unscathed. They were, they were safe. But she was one of the people that the house was torn, the roof was torn off because of um, uh, uh, Howard Hughes. Okay, the middle slide on the upper, on the, uh, in the middle, that is Eddie Foy Jr. And in the movie, they have a recreation of George M. Cohan, portrayed by Jimmy, um, meeting the original Eddie Foy. Uh, that was uh, uh, a fictitious meeting. They were friends. They knew one another. And we'll go into that later on. But they were best friends, uh, Eddie Foy and James Cagney. George Tobias is on the upper right. Many of you are going to remember him from a TV series. You know, I don't even have to mention a name. And I'll bet you people are going to start throwing it in there. I'm not even going to tell you. But he was famous for being on a TV series with his wife, uh, and they, they were always peeking in at the uh, star of the show, always looking out the window. Um, anyway, that, that's in. <laughs> I want to see if people remember. There it is. It already popped in. Bewitched. That's him. Gold On star goes to Irene. <laughs> yeah. On the bottom left, that's Joan Leslie uh, playing his wife to be Mary. Um, this scene was. And we're going to go into this more uh, in detail in a little while. But this is when they were singing the great song, Harrigan. Who would remember that song if it weren't for this movie? And who would remember? I mean, this, this little moment that is in the film was brilliantly done. It was so simplistic. But you can't get the song out of your head once you watch it. Now, Jimmy had a tendency of always doing things on his own, he would take a step forward and try to make things better. And uh, by the way, when she arrived, Joan, when she arrived on, to, when cast in this movie, I hate to tell you this, she was 17 years old. That's her. She was 17 years old when she was cast in this film. Um, and, and Cagney was 42. But she held up. She did it. She got through it. So she shows up on the set. They know they're going to do the Harrigan number. And, and Jimmy says to her, I have an idea. Um, we're going to sing the song and you're going to go this way and I'm going to go that way. And then we'll, and he's, he's giving all the choreography for her. And between them, they come up with this whole thing that we see on film. So what happens next is Michael Curtiz, who's the director, comes on. 
and he says, okay, we're going to do Harrigan today. Anybody have any ideas? And, and George says, uh, George, <laughs> Jimmy says, I've got the whole thing laid out. They do it for him. He says, perfect. And that's how they filmed it. It was all James Cagney's choreography in that number. The whole thing is just brilliant. I love it. Middle, in the middle there, um, Francis Langford has a very small part in the movie. Francis Langford, uh, as you know, was on the road quite a bit with Bob Hope doing his USO tours. When she was cast to do this film, there was an actress by the name of Nora Bays, who was a best friend of George M. Cohan. And Nora uh, worked with him on many, many occasions. When they were making this scene, she would not allow her name, Nora, to be used in the film. It, she wasn't allowed, they, she just didn't want anybody to know her. It went fine, but if you watch that scene again, this is the scene where all the lights go out. They're outdoors doing a show for the troops. All the lights go out, the electricity is gone, and George M. runs out to all the trucks and the jeeps, and he says, turn your lights on, turn your lights on, and they turn the lights onto the stage, and that's how they could do it. As he's jumping off the stage, he says, keep them busy, Nora. <laughs> and he uses her name anyway. So it's kind of funny, uh, that one moment. Uh, on the bottom uh, right, that's S.Z. Sakal, uh, better known as Cuddles. And we're going to talk about him uh, later on in, in a little bit more depth. But he was in Casablanca. He was with uh, Danny Kaye in Wonder Man. Um, he was with um, Barbara Stanwyck in Ball of Fire. Uh, Christmas in Connecticut and the good old summertime, Lullaby of Broadway. She was, he was a favorite in these movies. He, there was something about him. People just loved cuddles. Okay, next slide, please. So Michael Curtiz, here he is, directed films, little things like um, Casablanca on the left. He also did um, Angels with Dirty Faces with Mr. Cagney. He also did uh, Captain Blood, Adventures in Robin Hood, The Sea Wolf, uh, Mildred Pierce, White Christmas. He did, directed White Christmas. So Michael Curtiz was very, very um, uh, knowledgeable. What's interesting about him, about Curtiz, there wasn't a genre that he could not handle. When I just named all those films, we're talking about musicals, adventures, swashbucklers, comedies. He did it all. He just had these natural instincts. We'll be talking about him again in a few minutes. Next slide, please. So they're <clears throat> on set and somebody brings in a uh, radio, plugs in the radio and um, Pearl Harbor. They were rehearsal, uh, rehearsing, excuse me. And um, while they're rehearsing, they stopped everything to listen to uh, Day of Infamy, uh, the FDR speech on the radio. And um, Cagney says to everybody, I, when they turned off the radio, he said, I think this is the time we should all say a prayer. And the entire group got in a big circle, held hands and said a prayer together for those that were lost. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Michael Curtiz, when he heard this, he said, well, we've got a great story to tell here about America. Let's get to work and do a good job and make it the best damnedest patriotic movie ever made. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing right here. I'm, I'm very glad that it was in black and white. In black and white, there was just something about the nostalgia of it. It really played well. In color, and I do have several color shots that are gonna be interspersed here. I think it would have been a little bit overwhelming to the eye but here, um, they were determined. you got to remember the audience. This is 1942. The war is on. Um, they wanted to make the best damn patriotic film ever. Do you think they could get away with doing this today? That's my question. Could they make this movie over again today? I know I shouldn't be saying that, but um, I love this film. I can't say it any other way. Let's go to the next slide before I start pontificating. Okay. <laughs> now, when, when Jack Warner took over and he said he's going to make this movie, uh, he, when he said he was making it as a prestige movie, that was a way of saying that we're going to pull out all stops. And 
he wanted to make sure that the movie was as accurate as it could be. Now, George M. gave them specific restrictions on how the script could be written. He had final approval on everything. Anything that went into the movie, he had final approval. He had final approval when the movie was over. Before they released it, he got to see it one more time before he would give it the green light. But aside from that, and we'll get into that later, all the costumes that you're seeing, all the theaters that you see in the movie are exact replicas of what George M. Cohan had in his, on his stage shows. Everything you're seeing is exactly the way an audience would have seen it at the height of George M. Cohan. Um, and when you see theaters, they have a lot of uh, scenes taking place in theaters. Those were replicas of the theaters that George M. Cohan had his shows in. So they pulled out, everything was to the nines, making this as, po as, as positive and as perfect and as um, uh, creatively original as they could make it. They really uh, went out of the way. On the upper right-hand corner, um, that's uh, Irene uh, Manning. And she was a wonderful uh, singer and dancer. And she has a great scene in the movie. Her costumes, I want you to, when you watch this movie again, and I know it's going to be on for the 4th of July, I want you to look at it with new eyes. I want you to look at it as if you're seeing it for the first time and just look at the costumes, look at the, um, uh, at the set design, everything about it is just so perfect. Irene Manning was 28 when she filmed this and um, she only made, I think two movies after this and then she left the movie business, which is sad. Again, when you see the movie again, she is beautiful and she is gifted. She's got a great voice, but movies were not her forte. She loved the stage. And from this point on, she went back to, uh, to the theater. And that's where she lived out the rest of her performing career on the stage. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Ah, uh, this is the best part. This is this is what the whole movie is about right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's, um, let's talk about all this. Um, when Jimmy was going to do this, um, he got a, a gentleman by the name of Johnny Boyle to come and assist him. Johnny Boyle was George M. Cohan's original choreographer. And he taught him everything that, that Cohan would do. When you're watching Cohan, uh, Cagney, that is Cohan. That everything that you're seeing is the way he would dance. Now, uh, some people would call this eccentric dancing and there was a term for it. And if you look at um, Ray Bolger as the Scarecrow, and in, and in many movies, uh, Ray Bolger and Buddy Ebsen, they were also um, uh, using this form of dancing. It was, it was very, very popular. Uh, not many people could, could do it. Hence, that's why Fred Astaire said, there's no way I could do this movie. There's no way, he said. Now, the scene on the right, and we can't show it right now, but that's the, at the very end of the movie. He had just finished speaking with the president. He's coming down the stairs, and it's only 35 seconds of him tap dancing down a flight of stairs. He never told anybody he was going to do it. He never told Michael Curtiz. All he was supposed to do was exit the uh, White House. He just wanted to show his exuberance. He wanted to show he was lighter than air, that he just got the uh, medal from the president and he was feeling uh, like he was on a cloud. That was all Cagney. Again, just like he did with the earlier scene with Harrigan, he did this on his own without telling anybody. And I may be wrong, but it's probably the most well, it is. When I do my lectures, this one moment comes up more than any other moment in the movie. People remember him coming down the stairs. Yeah, me uh, too. Fly, this... I'll give you a side, a, a funny side note. We were doing the story of jo George M. Cohan at one of our sites in New Jersey. Uh, it's called Georgian Court Mansion. It's a beautiful mansion, and they have a staircase similar to this, all marble coming down. 
and we had our actor and we showed him the scene. And I said, we just want to try to get this moment so that we can recreate it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. There, It is, first of all, coming down a flight of stairs and thinking you're going to tap dance on those stairs as you're coming down, made of marble, just like here, what Cagney's doing. That took a lot for him to do that. I don't know it's, if Cagney rehearsed it. Nobody talked about it. He just knew how to do it, and he did it in that scene. Okay, and it is really it is really challenging. You, as, is challenging. Aside from just the danger of being on stairs, the move he's he's working on, and I've been trying to work on my own tap dancing. Yeah. I think he's doing some sort of drawback, which on flat land would be challenging, and he's doing them single footed and alternating <laughs> while descending a narrow plank of stairs. It's incredible, really. And the, all the while just expressing his joy. Let me explain one more thing about uh, Cagney. Um, in one of our previous programs, we talked about the Irish Mafia, uh, <laughs> that uh, James Cagney and Spencer Tracy and a group of the Irish um, actors would meet like once a month and talk about their latest projects. <clears throat> when Cagney finally signed the contract and he got this role, he brought the, uh, he got together with everybody and he said, I, I got to tell you something. I'm doing this George M. Cohan thing. He says, I, I want to get your opinion. He says, when I do the dancing and all, I'm going to do George M. Cohan to the best of my ability. I'm going to learn everything that he did. I'm going to, I'm going to present that on the stage. But when I'm doing all the other scenes, I think I'm going to just play Cagney. He said, I just, I'm just going to be myself in the others. And then when I'm doing George M. Cohan, I'll do all his dancing the way he would do it. And they all agree with it. And that's what we're seeing. You're seeing two performances at once. You're seeing the Cagney performance, and you're also seeing the George M. Cohan performance in one movie. Interesting. Next, next please. Ah, all right. I already told you about that moment there with uh, Harrigan. And I just want to talk to you about Cuddles. Uh, that's Richard Thorpe on the right. Uh, this is the scene where they convince Cuddles that they uh, are putting together a show and they need his money to put it together. Uh, what's kind of interesting is he, uh, James Cagney and, and Cuddles did not get along. Uh, they just didn't get along. And the, the, the problem was that Cuddles was a fantastic actor, terrific actor, a lovable actor. There was something about him. When you saw him, there was a reason they called him Cuddles. And Cagney always felt that when he had his back to him, that Cuddles was doing little gestures to steal the scene from him. And he went to Michael Curtiz and he said, to, he said, Michael, you got to do something about him. Pull him back. Do something. He's stealing the scenes. Michael never said a word to him. Never went to Cuddles. Never said a word. Why? Because Michael Curtiz happened to be Hungarian. S. <clears throat> as Zizekal was Hungarian. When he was growing up, Michael Curtiz, he saw Cuddles on stage in Hungary. He knew he was a master actor, and he was not about to go and try to reprimand an actor that he knew that was as gifted as he was. That was the only time the two worked together. Uh, the reason I had this moment up here, besides it being the only scene with it, Again, Cagney does one of his Cagneyisms. At the very end of the scene, he's got to sign the contract. They give him a pen. They give him the. Uh, he's writing out a check. As he's writing out the check, Cagney leans over him and kisses him on the top of his hat. Just a little bit of business that Cagney threw in there, and it, he he always felt he had to have a button, some kind of button that you're going to remember that scene for some reason, and I. As a kid, remember him kissing him on the top of the hat. There's another scene where he introduces the song Mary uh, to uh, Joan. And he's telling her how to sing it and everything. And at the end of it, she says, oh, oh, George. And he says, take it up an octave. And she goes, oh, George, and brings her voice up. Again, that was just something that Cagney threw at her. And she picked up on it and did it. And it worked perfectly. So he was always doing little bits of business. You would never think Cagney 
was that creative and that um, funny, to be honest with you, to add these little moments into the movies, but that was him. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, also, I wanna let you know, we do need to continue moving, moving along. Oh, are we running late? Well, we're get, we're getting there. We're not behind yet, but we are we are getting there. Also, you know what? While we're moving forward, can I launch one more poll? I, I don't want us to run out of time for go a favorite Cagney movie. Here we go. So we're just interested. What's your favorite Cagney movie? And the options we have today are Yankee Doodle Dandy, Angel with Dirty Faces, Love Me or Leave Me, and Public Enemy. Where do you... <laughs> <laughs> it's all for Yankee Doodle Dandy. It okay. is just flying. Well, we know our audience has good taste. That's it. Yeah, a couple for Angels and Dirty Faces, a couple for Love Me or Leave Me. There's a good 16% uh, go went to Public Enemy, but definitively 80% is Yankee Doodle Dandy. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> we chose the right film today. Okay, so we're going to, I don't want to speed it, but I want to get all the, as much as I can get in here. You know, this is the uh, premiere of the movie. There's James Cagney and his wife, Billy, at the premiere. Uh, I hate to tell you this, Cagney was five foot five, just so you know. When you're watching him, he does not, he stands tall. He's a tall five foot five. There's no question about it. Um, they showed the movie to George M. Cohan and... Um, Cagney's words were, oh, my God, that's a tough act to follow. He gave it full approval of the film. He didn't change anything. Some of the things that, were, that, that had to be kept out of the movie, he didn't want any signs of affection, romance. He, uh, he, didn't, he was married twice. Um, his wife's name was not Mary, just so you know. And um, they, they used this, the script writers just used that because they, um, they knew there was a song called Mary and it would be incorporated into the film beautifully if they could do that. All right, well, let's go to the next slide. Ah, there's Cagney winning his Academy Award, his only Academy Award in his lifetime. In the middle, if you wanted to take another test, um, that's Greer Garson winning her Academy Award. And you could, uh, okay, I'll let, it, I'll let the audience tell you what movie she won the Academy Award for. Uh, that's Gary Cooper. Uh, all six foot four of him standing over <laughs> James Cagney. Getting Almost a foot cancer. taller. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Um, after this movie, there was no stopping Cagney. Uh, he made a con uh, several really great movies. Mr. Roberts on the bottom left is one of my favorite movies, uh, The Strawberry Blonde with Olivia de Havilland and Rita, Rita Hayworth. Uh, nobody could forget White Heat, Top of the World, Ma, Love Me or Leave Me with Doris Day, uh, his last film. Um, well, let's go, let's go to the next slide. So the years go by, about a dozen years, and he gets a phone call from a friend of his by the name of Bob Hope, who's making a movie called The Seven Little Foys. Um, Bob was at a point in his career where he had done so many comedies he was really looking for that Academy Award and he was looking for a movie that was somewhat dramatic uh, and had humor and had music. And he said, you know, I want to make this movie. And um, <clears throat> one of the scenes in the movie that was written into the script, and we can go to the next slide, was George M. Cohan and Eddie Foy having a dance off at the Friars Club. Now, I don't know if you can see it on the top left uh, picture, right next to um, Jimmy Cagney's leg. There's George Tobias. George Tobias was in Yankee Doodle Dandy. And here he is now in The Seven Little Foys. He just, he just kept working. Oh, and you're right. He was in uh, Bewitched. So here they are. They're working for three weeks rehearsing this number. And you can see uh, Cagney and uh, Hope really, really trying to get this thing down perfect. That whole dance number runs about two and a half minutes on screen. If you go onto my favorite clips, you're going to see all these clips are there. You can watch every one of them and enjoy them. Here's the, the punchline on this. Cagney was 55 years old when he did this. Okay, He was 42 when he did Yankee Doodle Dandy. 
there is not a hiccup in his beat. I mean, he does this as if no time had passed at all. He's still floating on top of that table. There is as if he's uh, uh, like a marionette. Somebody's pulling his strings and he's just floating there. Amazing. So it comes time for him to get paid. And uh, he says to Bob, uh, I, I don't want any money for this. I'm, I'm, I'm just doing it for, for, for free. And uh, Bob says, wait a minute, it's in the budget. Don't worry about it. We're, we're going to pay you for your time you're doing. It. He says, let me tell you something. He says, when I was a young hoofer and I was working and trying to get work in New York, Eddie Foy brought me into his home. He gave me a clean bed and, and, and he gave me hot meals. Uh, he let me stay there as long as I could until I got on my feet. This is my way of repaying the Foy family for all they did for me in those early years. That's the kind of man Cagney was. They eventually donated all that money. One last thing. Uh, my daughter, Dana, Dana went to, um, um, we're, no, we're, no, I'm losing track of what school she went to, Iona. And every time we went to Iona uh, College, we would pass a little park right off the parkway. And it said Eddie Foy Park. And I'm saying, nobody knows who Eddie Foy is anymore. But that Eddie <laughs> Foy Park is still there, still up there. Amazing. Next slide. Okay, if I was to ask you what Cagney's last movie was, everybody would definitely type in there. Here Rag we go. Time. Let's find out. Okay. What's Cagney's last movie? Ragtime. We have a vote for Ragtime, Terrible Joe Moran. Oh, also the uh, Greta Garbo Oscar. We have a vote. Irene says Mrs. Maniver. Maniver? Yeah, it's uh, Greer Garson. Greer Garson. Yeah, and it's Mrs. Miniver. Thank you very Good. much. Yeah, well done. <laughs> and the vote, so some say Caesar, some say one, two, three, but second place goes to Terrible Joe Moran and first place goes to Ragtime. 58% of people think it's Ragtime. About 30% think it's Terrible Joe Moran. Well, here's the poop. Um, his final Hollywood movie was one, two, three. That was the, his final film. And then he retired. And he was living on his farm upstate New York. Uh, he was getting older. And his doctor said to him, you've got to get back to work and do something. You, gotta, you can't just sit here on the farm all day. And that's when he ended up doing Ragtime, which was a great, great uh, film. It was a terrific uh, way of seeing him on the screen again. And they brought his buddy, Pat O'Brien, to be with him in the movie as well. So that, that was a wonderful film. Once he did that movie, the offers started coming in for him to do other films. He made a TV movie, and there it is, Terrible Joe Moran, 1984, his last film. To his left is a young whippersnapper by the name of Art Carney. <laughs> and uh, Cagney plays a, uh, a boxer who's confined to a wheelchair, and Carney is his uh, companion and keeper. Um, here's, it, it, it was sad, but uh, at this point, his speech from having a stroke and all was so distorted that they could not understand him. His entire performance... The entire movie, very little of it is, is still uh, James Cagney's voice. But Rich Little came in and redid the entire soundtrack so that Cagney had his voice in that movie. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Interesting. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is really just my, my last slide. Uh, I want to give you a quote that Cadney uh, said in 1931. And he was talking, I love this picture of him, by the way. Uh, he was talking about actors and being an actor. And this is in 1931. He had just been doing films, um, just got into it. And he said, actors, they come and go. Of course, there's an exception now and then, but you can't count on that. Two more years and I'll be looking for a job on the stage again. Maybe I'll go back to Hoofen. What's the use kidding myself? This can't last forever. 91 years later, here we are 
talking about James Cagney and his hoofing and being delighted with his performances. Thank you. Well done. That's, that's, that's awesome. Uh, this movie, obviously, you can see there's still so much love and affection for it, and rightfully so. And James Cagney ability, and it just blows you away every time. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, uh, you know, when you talk about character and um, that one moment with Seven Little Foys, he put everything into that scene, and he knew he was doing it for nothing. Yeah. So let's see here. Eccentric, we have, that's eccentric dancing. We have a couple of um, questions. Did Cohan, did Cagney ever meet Cohan? What do they think of each other if they did? He, um, he and also, I'm going to throw yeah. up one more poll. If you've, how many of the ch chats have you seen with Sal? I'm just curious, but go ahead. Did they ever meet? Yeah, I, as I mentioned, he did audition for him when he was just in New York. There, there's there's a couple there's some speculation about Cagney meeting uh, Cohan and auditioning for him and the the um, what they were saying is if if Cohan saw Cagney at that point in his life Cagney was a really good dancer Cagney if you look at them together especially in that shot that we have of uh, of the families one on top of the other uh, earlier. If, if you look at that, Cagney did look a lot like Ed, uh, like um, Cohan. And many people felt that Cohan, not that he was egotistical, but he didn't want to have to play against himself on the same stage. Yeah. And that's why, yeah, but that, he never met with him while the movie was being made. No, he, he never did. Uh, I'll tell you one more thing about Cagney, uh, uh, Cohan, excuse me. Um, I, I have a similarity with him. And this is something that, that Darren could um, validate. When I'm writing one of my scripts, when I'm writing one of the shows that many of you have come to see over the years, it's not uncommon for me to sit up all night and work right through the clock. Um, and many times I would do that. And then at seven o'clock when, when the kids were having to get up to go to school, I would just get them, put, get them ready, get the food ready. Uh, Mary would help and then we would get them off onto the bus. But I would work all through the night. Cagney, here I go again, Cohan had the same work discipline. He would be on stage doing his Broadway show. He would get back to his apartment in New York City somewhere around midnight. He would start working. He had a full-time secretary that would stay with him all night long and type everything as he was dictating it. And then at the end, uh, during the course of that, he would actually have a chef on standby. And uh, if he wanted a steak and potatoes, which was his favorite, uh, they would make him steak and potatoes at that hour. Uh, so he worked all through the night. I didn't have anybody making me steak and potatoes in the middle of the night, though. OK. <laughs> um, I want to say uh, thanks to Lewis for eccentric, eccentric dancing. Good catch. Also, he was singing Harrigan in the chat window earlier when we were talking about it. So thank you for that. I'm looking here at the results. How many chit chats? Thank you so much. I see a few people. This is your first chit chat. Well, welcome to the party. You are in a safe space. This is wonderful. We look forward to these Monday mornings each week. Uh, we have a, a lot of people have seen either three or four of them, and a number of people have never missed one, which is really fantastic. So thank <laughs> <Wow>. you. <laughs> thank it you. Mean, it certainly means a lot to us, and we're always looking to grow and improve. So moving on to next week, let me uh, share here. We have our new website that we've been <laughs> we've been tirelessly working on to put this together. We have all the new programs listed for this upcoming week. You can register here in order to continue to improve the program. We do have some, some of the lectures that are going to have a small fee. You can click here to register and then you will receive, as it says here on the bottom, you'll receive an email with all of the link information to actually sign on to the program. So a slightly different way about going about it, but you can do it all from St. George Living History dot com or from southstgeorge.com it's the same website they'll take you to the same place not to worry you don't have to miss any of Aaron you're going to send out another email today uh actually you should already have it I believe it went out at 10 30 so you should have another email in your inbox if you didn't receive it just contact us uh, and we can send it to you again 
but it has links to all of this so that you can register more conveniently. Let's see here. We also have, let's go on. Where were we here? Let's share. And we have a couple of books that Sal is recommending. We have Cagney by Cagney, if you would like to learn more there, we'll send out an email about that, as well as Yankee Doodle Dandy. We have a book here. If you enjoy following us on Facebook, you can go over there. We're actually live on Facebook right now. Thank you to everybody watching. Keep up there. And if you want to see all of Sal's chit chats and um, all of his favorite clips, you can do so on YouTube. Just look for Sal St. George and you can see everybody that we have here. Lucille Ball, Danny Kay, Red Skelton. I mean, there's there's a lot to, to keep you busy. Thank you, everybody, so much. Every hey, Darren, week in. Darren, did we ask uh, a, 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 who's coming to the uh, John Wayne house? Oh, we have, yeah, we had another virtual tour confirmed. That's right, for, uh, let me see here. I'm pointing at it on my screen, and you can't see it yet. Let me pull that up. Right here, on the 13th, we have a free virtual road trip to uh, the John Wayne Museum. So I know we already have a number of registrants. I hope you're one of them. Can you see the whole, pro all the programs on YouTube? All the programs that we have done thus far, yes, you can see all those on YouTube. The ones that will have a fee attached, no, those will not be on YouTube um, any longer. It's just so that we can survive and keep moving forward and growing and learning and building and improving. The John um, Wayne, The John Wayne Museum is the John Wayne birthplace and museum. Uh, we're really excited about going there and we already have a surprise virtual tour for the following month. I'm not going to tell you where we're going, but uh, for those that are regulars, you know, we already went to the Red Skelton Museum. Now we're going to the John Wayne Museum and we're going to continue trying to find uh, museums around the country that will allow us to uh, wake them up at 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, and, let us, and let us go into the museum with them. These are all give, private tours. I'm real excited about the John Wayne Museum. Can I give one um, one little uh, teaser for those who uh, for the for our next virtual road trip? Just one little hint. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, if anybody if you stuck around this long, I think you I think you've earned a, a hint for the next program, and it has to do with Hugh Jackman. So I think we can, I think that's that's enough to say, right? Oh, you're talking about the September trip? September, yes. It's connected somehow to, to the actor Hugh Jackman. Yes. Okay. We're not going to his house, but- No, we're not going to his house, which <laughs> would be nice. <laughs> we'll wake him up. <laughs> All of you. All right, let's- I'm let's sure he's home. It. Yeah, everybody's home. Yeah. Let's call it there. Thank you so much, everybody. As always, it's wonderful. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Have, have a wonderful week, everybody. Bye -bye.